It was another long night. The cornfields burned for most of it. The camp remained on high alert as the fires lit up the fields under the cover of moonlight. Billy and I had a long talk throughout the night. He admitted he couldn't make the difficult decisions, but he wanted to save face for everyone else that remained at Wood Creek. We came to the agreement that I would lead and make the calls behind the scenes and Billy would act like he was still running the show. My first decision was to scrap the ridiculous rule of not being armed. If you had a firearm, you were expected to carry it everywhere you went. Anyone that wasn't armed and was able-bodied was put on wood assembly. We needed all the wood we could gather and process for the ever-approaching winter. By first daybreak, I had estimated we'd lost roughly 75% of our corn crops. A small group of a dozen or so was able to harvest a few hundred years yesterday before the intentional fire was set. Until Ridge Creek is terminated, there was no more jukebox and video games. I wasn't fond of Nate, but he was the best recon runner we had. We loaded him up with comms and gear, sent him off to gather any information on Ridge Creek he could. Not only would we have armed patrol atop the campers at both entrances, we'd also have a 24-7 patrol throughout the interior of Wood Creek. It was time to use the electric golf carts for something more than Billy's personal transportation. Anyone who wasn't able to be part of the wood assembly group was going to be given fishing poles and was expected to catch dinner for us. We'd wait for Nate to return with any intel he gathered before mounting a retaliatory strike. I didn't want to blindly send a group on the suicide mission if I could all but help it. I had all the volunteers that were willing to fight meet me at my cabin to divide up the extra firearms I had acquired. This was something you would never have expected to do two months ago. You could have went to prison for this type of thing, giving firearms and ammunition to people you didn't even know. Times have changed, and you now did whatever was needed in order to survive and live another day. I had eight people show up, only five firearms to give away. I was keeping my AR, my Mossberg 500, and a 9mm. My wife was keeping the second AR I had come across weeks ago. I decided to do a vetting process, went with the most experienced shooters out of the eight. I had an abundance still of 12 gauge, 223, and 556. Less than 500 rounds of 9mm that Jack had stored in his house. The Mosin Nagant only had two rounds left. I chose the most experienced because we couldn't afford to waste ammo on training. We now had five more members of our group armed. What I had kept to myself was the one remaining grenade I had left. That had the potential to be a game changer when we invaded Ridge Creek. Billy and I gathered at the rec hall awaiting any word from Nate so we could devise a plan. Billy thanked me for stepping up, being the leader this campsite had desperately needed. I explained to him I'd already lost too many, and those were just the ones I know of. The majority of my family and friends, I still had no idea if they were alive or possibly dead by now. Billy had no siblings. His parents dedicated the majority of their lives to Wood Creek, before going on any more children. His mother... Mrs. Eddy had lived to 93 years old before being killed in cold blood during the original attack from Ridge Creek. She now rested peacefully next to the house she had lived at for seven decades. Nate had finally radioed and made contact with us. The connection wasn't clear. The two miles plus the tall pine trees were stretching the limit on my Beofang walkies. Nate, come in again. You're breaking up, I said. Billy and I listened closely with anticipation on channel 22, the same channel I ran with Joe. Nate's voice once again cut in and out. It was increasingly difficult to make out anything he was saying. Damn it, I said. We gotta get closer to him to make anything out. 
We both ran out towards the entrance to stand atop the campers blocking our entrance. It was about a quarter mile run and the static continued to cut Neat's voice off. The armed guards seeing us approaching had no idea why we were running towards them. I climbed up the ladder and began calling out to Nate. Nate, do you copy? Nate, copy. That's when I heard a gunshot go off in the distance and at the same time heard it loud and clear over the walkie. I presume Nate had just been executed. A voice came over the walkie and said, you're now down to 54. I was shocked at that response. How does he know the exact number of people at our camp, Billy asked. There's only one way, I replied. We've got a spy inside our camp. That's when my heart sank. I had just given firearms to five people less than an hour ago. Could I have given the informant one of our, one of our guns? Nate was most likely dead, and we had a traitor among us. This was not how this mission was supposed to end. I told Billy we need to figure out who the snake is immediately before we lose more people. I asked if he had a list of everyone who was still here at Wood Creek. No, he said. I hadn't really thought of that. Minus Billy and my family, that put the number of possibilities at 48. 16 children minus my three was 13. I highly doubted any of them were our spy. The number of possibilities now dropped to 35. We next had to figure out how many of those were seasonal campers. We could probably eliminate them too. I radioed my wife, told her to be on guard. We've got a Ridge Creek member inside our perimeter, and they may be armed. Get you and the girls into the cabin right now, I yelled. I'm on my way, and we'll be there in minutes. Billy, I have to get to my family. We can figure this out once we get to my place, and I know they're safe. If you need to sound the air horn, put Wood Creek in lockdown and have everyone shelter in place until we figure out who we're looking for. As Billy made his way into the general store to sound the alarm, gunshots began to echo out through the woods. My wife called out over the radio that she couldn't find Alicia. Where was she last, I asked. She was on her way up to the store less than five minutes ago. Stay inside the cabin. I'll find her, I said. I handed Billy my sidearm, said Alicia's missing, let's go. I had counted six gunshots being fired. We had no choice but to head directly towards the area they were coming from. Halfway down the path, I seen Alicia's body laying in the gravel. I raced over to her now lifeless body, letting my guard down completely. She had suffered a single round directly in the head. There was a 9 millimeter casing on the ground next to her. She was shot at extremely close range, execution style. I had given two handguns away that morning, one to a male named Shane and one to a female named Karen. Had to be one of those two, I said to Billy. I heard two more rounds go off. I witnessed Billy fall to the ground besides me. A third shot struck me in the back left shoulder. I fell forward onto Alicia's dead body trying to turn around and draw my AR on the shooter. A fourth shot rang out. Finally, the shooter was put down. Daryl, our comms guy, and the one who got the arcade games and the jukebox working, had fired a single 308 round from his Savage Axis hunting rifle. The shooter was Karen, the only female who had stepped forward and volunteered this morning. She killed Billy, Alicia, and shot me with the Glock 17 I had given her. Daryl said there's more. She killed three others and wounded one. Let me have a look at your shoulder, he said. I didn't feel an exit wound on the front side. Daryl said I was lucky and had ricocheted off my shoulder blade. It hurt like hell to move. I couldn't help but feel responsible for the attack. I had fired on the thieves in the cornfield. I'd sent Nate to do the recon work, and I had stupidly given the firearm to Karen that was responsible for killing five and wounding two. My wife and two daughters had now come out and made their way across the bridge to me. My oldest collapsed at the sight of her best friend dead. My wife and youngest hugged me tight before consoling Desiree. 
Wood Creek was in complete chaos and carnage. Billy was gone, succumbing to the same fate his mother had just over a week ago. More screams let out, and I had no idea what it could possibly be now. They were coming from the bridge just a short distance away. Nate's body had been sent downstream from Ridge Creek. Daryl fished it out, and when he turned it over, both of his eyes had been removed. There was a piece of wood nailed to his chest that read, We don't like wandering eyes. <laughs>